people don't have a well-constructed plan. Like they're just not pre prepared enough. Like it's all preparedness. How mm. prepared are you? The motor program is an invariant representation in your brain. Like the, the memory doesn't change, but the way that you unfold the memory changes as you need to relay this memory into the current context that you're finding yourself in. It's not as cookie cutter as you think it is. It's fluid and flexible and something that you can return to. It is something that will provide the invariant representation starting point that you build off of. People don't appreciate how important planning is. And planning is just deliberate practice and sitting and imagining and working through the possibilities and figuring out how it works. And if you've done that, then you're prepared. Hey, Pat, welcome back to the podcast. All right, Sean, it's always a pleasure to be back. I know we've had some good ones before. I think uh, that one we had, the last one was with Evan. Correct. And that was a great talk. So yeah, I mean, let's, let's, uh, let's do another one of these that, that ends up being really successful. I'm always down. Yeah, so for those who haven't listened to the previous ones, episode number 12, uh, just Pat, and then uh, episode number 23 with Evan and Pat talking about all things hypertrophy. So today, Pat, we're talking about your new book uh, that you recently released. So can you talk a little bit about when did you decide to write this book? Yeah, so the book, which is called A Coach's Guide to Optimizing Movement, and the subtitle is Rethinking the Big Patterns. It's a uh, it's a book that I think it was, I mean, it's, I'm pretty sure it was about two years ago. Um, I was presenting at an event called The Reckoning. And for me, that was a really critical event, like in terms of where I, how I felt about myself career-wise. So uh, Mike Ranfone hosted that event and I was invited to speak at it. And the other speakers were Doug Kachigian and Bill Hartman. And for me, you know, Bill has, been an idol for me for a long time and you know I look up to him more than anyone else in our field I, I, you know I think that he has a better overall understanding of how the human body moves and how to influence the body from an adaptive uh, training perspective better than anyone that I think exists on the planet um, so you know when for me, getting this opportunity to present in the same lineup as him was the equivalent for me being called up to the major leagues. You know, it was like I had uh, sort of shown some talent and people kind of knew who I was to some degree. But in this particular instance, like getting a chance to be to, to, to do that was like, mm -hmm. hey, kid, this is your shot. Show us what you've got. You got a 98 mile an hour fastball or not. And so that event was... Um, was a really like for me I, pre I prepared uh the presentation that i did for that for for months and months and months i put more work into that presentation than anything i had previously done in my life uh my doctoral dissertation included in that list like this was something that i i really took seriously and i really saw as as this opportunity and and quite honestly it, it was more for me like trying to I felt like my presentation was a presentation of Bill. I wanted to show him that I had the goods, that, that I was really, um, you know, somebody, somebody worth uh, being in this field and operating at a high level. Mm. And, you know, I, I still feel that, that for me, the most proud, you know, I, I don't get a feeling of like excitement or celebration after doing something. You know, I can remember finishing, defending my doctoral dissertation and it was like, yeah, all right, whatever. Uh, you know, I've, I've done other things that like people are like, oh, you must be so excited about. It. And I'm like, eh, I, I don't know, like what I like, not really, I don't really care. But I, I remember um, doing my presentation at the reckoning and Bill came over to me after and he said, that was the best presentation on neuro I have ever seen. And that was the best feeling I've ever had professionally. Mm -hmm. And one of the best feelings I've ever had in my life, period. So you know, to me, like that just sort of sets the stage for what that that weekend was about for me. But you know, the like simultaneous to that, like Bill did uh, his presentation, which was on 
the thorax half of it was kind of on the the thorax mm -hmm. and the other was was sort of like uh you know a lesson on learning and how we learn and and things of that nature and during the part where he was going through that he sort of famously at this point said you know i want you guys to write out your models no seriously write out your models and you know i i was like and and he gave all the reasons why you know this whole idea of like taking your intrinsic knowledge and making it or, or your implicit knowledge and making it explicit through this process of really writing out your model and then after you go through this explicit uh, procedure then you'll return to your implicit knowledge as you're operating in your day-to-day -day work life but that implicit knowledge will be so much more refined and effective and powerful it's very similar to Daniel Kahneman's message in, in thinking fast and slow mm -hmm. with system one and system two of the brain that for the vast majority of humans on this planet they operate all the time in system one and it's very much an unrefined, ignorant system one. Like we believe everything that we think in our heads, we make up our minds very quickly. But we're generally speaking wrong and filled with heuristics and just, you know, totally flawed logic, this, that, and the other thing. The only Kahneman, and he, he won a Nobel Prize for this thesis, said that the only chance you have of really being a high functioning intellectual powerhouse and an effective thinker is to take your implicit knowledge and then put it through the meat grinder of system two, which is this slow, deliberate process of evaluating that which you think. And by doing so and using science and evidence and researching it and learning about this topic in an unbiased way, if you spend enough time doing this, and this is kind of that famous sort of 10,000 hours rule, which in reality is kind of an arbitrary number but if you take your time with deliberate practice and system two approaches to things you'll rewire and reframe and change everything about the way in which your brain understands a particular topic and after you go through that procedure now when you return to your fast operating implicit system one you've changed it and it's a powerhouse and it recognizes patterns so quickly and profoundly that it's truly a, a, an incredible machine at that point. So that's why everyone should write out their model. No, seriously, write out your model. And I began that process the next weekend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, it was legitimately just this exercise of really trying to write out my model for my own benefit. And I remember uh, relatively soon after that event being contacted by uh, a couple of guys that had previously been some of my students at Springfield College, and they operate a gym out of the Boston area. And they said, hey, you know, we'd, we'd really like to have you come up and do a seminar for us. Like, uh, you know, it's not going to be big, like we're not a huge gym, we don't have a huge following or anything, but we'd love to have you and make it work. And, and I was happy to do so. And we kind of figured out what the topic would be. And it was, uh, you know, something along the lines of, I believe the title of the presentation was Common Pitfalls with Off-Season Training. Mm -hmm. It was something like that, or maybe exactly that. <clears throat> and I, I started thinking like, all right, well, you know, what exactly did these guys want or something along those lines. But then I started thinking to myself, well, it's the same pitfalls as everything else. Like, people don't have a well-constructed plan. Like they're just not pre prepared enough. Like it's all preparedness. How mm. prepared are you? And if you're a coach, like the only thing that you can control is your own coaching model and your own level of planning. So how do you go about creating a model and how do you go about planning it out? And what variables do you take into consideration? So it, it began, in truth, like rethinking the big patterns began with this presentation of, you know, common pitfalls with off season training. And, you know, I sat down and I, I made the basic skeleton of, of this, you know, the beginning of the design. And I gave this presentation and I, I thought it went okay. Um, and, you know, very soon after that, 
I was asked to do a presentation in, in Austin, Texas. And with that presentation, that was the first time that I had named it Rethinking the Big Patterns. And I went down there and I had had this experience of this previous weekend to, to kind of talk through this thing and work through it a little bit. <clears throat> so the Austin one had a new title and it was a little bit more refined. And I gave that presentation and that one got recorded and, you know, it became an online product. And, you know, the, that's a whole other story in terms of like, I still get people asking me for that damn product and I'm like, uh, you know, for various reasons, it's no longer available. Uh, mostly from a, a managerial standpoint of, uh, you know, the people in charge of that website. But, you know, it was early. It was the, it was the second kind of early version of this thing. And, and it was nice because there were some, some great people in attendance and I knew that there was going to be some pressure on because it was going to be recorded in a product. So I wanted to make it good. <clears throat> you know, after that, I did another presentation in Vancouver, um, which I believe, you know, you, you put together. Yep, correct. And that one was, was really the third version of it. And it started to really click at that point. And, and in that one, I remember the flight out to Vancouver, thinking to myself about the organization of, of the way that I put the, the categories of exercise together mm. and those kind of big cards that sort of lived in, the pre, in that presentation. And that was a big emphasis of that presentation was just this organizational system, this taxonomy. And, <clears throat> you know, when I think about it, that was, that was sort of like, you know, the, the first seminar was, was really based on the organization of the material and that's something that I, I've since called movement quality and movement quantity, which mm -hmm. are pillars one and two of what's now a seven pillar model. And then after that, you know, the, the seminar also really focused on movement standardization, which I didn't call at that point, but that's now pillar three of what's now a seven pillar model. And, and that was basically all that seminar was, it was three pillars and you know, I remember after that seminar, I, I sat down and because it was like I had given this thing three times at that point, I felt like I had started to organize the big topics in my own head to a certain degree, but I wanted to actually write it out. Like I, so I sat down and I tried to write out the seminar in a Word doc format. And mm -hmm. I ended up turning that written out version into two articles that I sent over to Simply Faster and they put it on their website. There's two of them in there. And it was basically the, the, that seminar, you know, which was uh, creating a taxonomy and creating um, sensory motor competencies, which I think I called sensory motor competencies for the first time in that article. Hmm. So that was really what I would have called rethinking the big patterns one as a seminar. And what's interesting is after I wrote out the, those articles for Simply Faster, I started, my brain started to go to like, well, what, ne what else needs to come together for this thing to make this a more effective model? Like, how do I, I've, I've established this as kind of its base, mm. but what can be added to this thing? <clears throat> and, and that's the next thing that I started to do is to create what's now called the principles of progression. And, and that's now pillar number four. Um, so I really built out rethinking the big patterns too as a seminar series on adding this pillar four to the previous three pillars. And that fourth pillar really felt like a big deal to me. And I, I hoped and really, I felt like to me, it was the biggest part that I had added because it was looking at every possible motor program that you could coach into people. And it tried to provide a, a principle based approach for telling people exactly what to do to start people off with having them be successful. You know, I, I had, um, I had kind of had like these, these big theoretical concepts that had gone into rethinking the big patterns. One, you know, there were these backbone theoretical pieces mm. and, you know, there was variability, there's asymmetry, uh, you know, but, there's also one called invariant representations. And, and that one, like if you go through the book, you'll see that one's the second of these theoretical models 
that are the backbone of the thinking that goes into the entire um, you know, structure of this model. And the invariant representation is this, the way that we store memories uh, as, a, as an animal. And that it's, you know, you, you create this one model in your own head that represents a concept. And it's almost easier to, to give examples of it. And I always give the same example to, to illustrate the concept, which is signing your name. You know, it's like your brain forms the memory of signing your name by, by learning this procedure. You know, someone has to teach you for the first time this procedure. And then you begin to form this memory and you, you know, at a certain point after all of these repetitions and everything else, like you can sign your name very easily. And then I, I point out to people, hey, can, can you take your elbow and aim it in front of you and you can sign your name in the air in front of you with your elbow and you can do it with your nose in front of you if you want. You can point your toe and sign your name. The motor program is an invariant representation in your brain. Like the, the memory doesn't change, but the way that you unfold the memory changes as you need to relay this memory into the current context that you're finding yourself in and the specific demands that are being placed on you to take this memory and to bring it out into the world as a motor display. <clears throat> so the principles of progression and the orders in which you're, I'm, I'm recommending that you start were to me the easiest way across the board for every trainable pattern to begin the process for someone to create a beautiful initial invariant representation for how to do things. Mm -hmm. And if you create the right starting invariant representation for a motor program, now as the person develops more complexity of that motor program and wants to display it in different ways, it's going to be so much easier because every new rendition is always going to be based and modeled off of the a priori first version of it. <clears throat> So that was like, to me, I'm like, oh my God, this is such a critical thing. I really hope people get this and like understand like that, that this list, like if you're screwing it up and at any point in time, you can always take someone back to this list and modify the way that the activity is being performed. And you mm -hmm. can really go in and kind of hijack the invariant representation and make it better or change it, make it new and fresh. And now it can, it can move forward and, in this particular way of this again like here are the principles of where to start and here are the principles for exactly how to move forward within this this structural design so when i think about rethinking the big patterns too it was simply the add-on and it's like i don't i don't like it when i just say just the add-on of this one pillar but it was the add-on of this one pillar you know it was kind of like hey, we're gonna go back and talk about the first three pillars again, because they're really important, you need a refresher. And, but we're going to learn how to coach people through exercises and base the coaching off of these principles of progression. So that now I, I, I don't need to, I'm going to give you these lists of my recommendation for the order of, of exercises and in every uh, pattern and stance and plane. <clears throat> but you should be able to think of exactly what that order. You should recreate this order. Maybe there's a few differences, but if you understood these principles, your order will look so similar to my order. It's not even funny, mm -hmm. um, but it gives you some flexibility based upon the equipment that you have and, and what you like to do and how you like to coach and all these other things. But in reality, it's just like, here's the most surefire way to increase the probability of the people that you coach and work with doing the things that you want them to do properly. And what's, that's great. Like that's just a super useful thing. So, you know, that was kind of rethinking the big patterns too. And I, I taught that thing a bunch of times and I really gained a better overall sense of, of command over how to relay the messages from this model as the more I taught it. And, uh, and, and really it was like, I, I've continued to learn. I've continued to pick things up from Bill in particular and pillars five, six, and seven, uh, kind of came through, through more things that I've learned through Bill with going to his, uh, the intensive a couple of times. And, you know, those pillars were movement strategy, 
muscular orientation and muscular action. And I feel like when those things came together with the previous four pillars, it turned it into this seven pillar model that I felt like was just like, oh my God, this is, this is something that actually differentiates. It, it, it explains the entire playbook of everything that you could possibly do from a training perspective with humans, everything it's there. It's like, you know, the entire mainframe. And now if you can carefully analyze the needs of a specific individual, whether they're general population, whether they're athletes, whether they're special populations, if you can decipher the needs that they have for their goals and you can decipher their limitations from testing results, you can now have a tremendous amount of guidance and power from the way in which you implement the exercise choices that you have for these people to truly funnel them in the direction that they need to go in to get exactly what you think are the correct adaptations. So, you know, it's it just, the thing evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved. And, and it's, it's in the writing of it too. It's like, it just kind of, you know, as I wrote it, it came together more and more solidly. As I learned more and incorporated it into the writing, it came together more and more solidly. And, you know, to me, like I, I finished writing the book in February of 2020. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> of course, in March 2020, COVID comes along. And I began my kind of content editing in, in March of 2020. And the beautiful thing was I had plenty of time, you know, I would go to the gym, there'd be nobody there. And I'd be able to work out and then I'd sit in, in silence for a couple of hours after that. And I could read and I could kind of rework the, the book and rework the concepts. And, you know, to me, like when I'm writing, I'm a bit like a, a cross-examining lawyer, just trying to poke as many holes in my own boat as I possibly can and see where water comes out. Mm -hmm. And I just did that day after day after day for hour after hour after hour. And it was very focused um, work. And, you know, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how long that took you know, maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks, something like that. But, but I felt like I had finally really finished the content editing and that it was, it was well, it was constructed well enough for what I wanted. And at that point in time, I, um, you know, I contacted the guys at Renaissance Periodization to let them know like, Hey, I think I'm done with what I wanted to put together. I think it's time for uh, you know, one of your editors to, to come along and, and do their magic with the, the way that it's written and the flow and the sound and all that kind of stuff. And they hooked me up with, uh, with Sonia Bramwell, who does at that point in time, you know, she's, she's doing her own thing. Now it was kind of like she was transitioning out while I was working with her, but she came in and, and we worked together, you know, right up until two weeks ago mm. with, the rewrite and it's great because she didn't have really any familiarity with my model or anything that I'm talking about. So if she could kind of understand it, it was perfect, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I love the way that she went in there and just kind of made the writing sound different. I was like, wow, this, I thought it was pretty good, but damn, this reads really well now. <laughs> this is, this is, wow. Huh? You make me sound amazing, Sonia. This is incredible. <laughs> um, and I was fortunate enough, you know, um, at Hype, we, we have uh, Diego Flores was, was working there. And, and he was somebody that I met doing a seminar in Boston. And, uh, you know, he, he and his fiance, Maya, are really very, very talented when it comes to graphic designs and, you know, all kinds of technology-based things. So, you know, we work together as a group to try to really – create great imaging and graphics and drawings for this book. You know, there's a ton of HD images in there to mm. demonstrate the exercises that we took from the exercise database that I put together two years ago or something along those lines, year and a half ago. You know, there's like Maya did the, the drawings herself for the anatomy parts. Um, you know, she did the cover, like she did, so many things like they like Maya killed herself working on this project 
Um, we had a, a, a number of interns, um, you know, helping with, with really being able to identify areas that needed to have imagery put in there to help people see it better mm-hmm. and understand it. So, you know, I, I'm somebody that I, I've never worked in groups. I've never been a group worker of any kind. Like, and, and this one forced me to have to go outside of that, you know, mm-hmm. to, to take this project, which was very near and dear to me. Um, this is a project I've worked much harder on than anything else I've ever done in my life. And then to allow other people in on it in a collaborative effort so that people with, with strengths that are not my strengths could make this thing really come to life for people. And so it's, it's quite honestly, this, this is something that I feel, I feel differently about this than anything I've ever done. You know, like mass and mass too were fun. You know, I, I kind of, I, I saw an opportunity with those things and I put mm-hmm. something together you know, and, and it was, it was worth it. It really helped my career. It really helped me financially, those two projects. But this was something that was much more serious to me. This, this really was, how do I actually conceptualize the possibilities of human training? And, you know, this is my brain trying to be put on paper in terms of everything that I think I understand about the big picture of the training process for humans down on in detail for people to be able to examine and, and like a a tremendous amount of faith put into other people to allow their skill sets to make this product something that will speak to people in a Mm -hmm. lot of ways. And so I really do hope that this is the product that, becomes very widespread that becomes something that is is like a a great resource for coaches in the field um because to me this product is me and you know just from a purely selfish standpoint or an egotistical standpoint i do want people to think that what i'm offering is is something that's really worthwhile and also that it's, you know, I, I've like, to me, like if, like, what's your point of being here? I, I don't, I don't ever have an exact answer for that. I, I think you can make up your point, but I do want to be somebody that is influential in, in this fitness, you know, ecosystem that we have. Um, because I do think that it's a, an insane ecosystem at this point in time. <laughs> and if I can help to kind of tame this thing and to provide something that is a powerful resource that makes people better coaches and that allows globally for exercise to be done much better by humans for better adaptations and reduced problems, then that's, that's something that I really feel like is what I want to accomplish with my career. And to me, this is a huge step towards reaching that as a, an overall vision. Yeah, I think that's, that's really well put, Pat. One thing that stood out to me is the fact that you wrote 198 pages before even talking about squats, hinges, pressing and pulling. So it's, it's much more than, you know, your usual kind of meatheads guide to the weight room. There's, there's layers upon layers before all those kind of, quote unquote, simple things come into place. The movement themselves, we know them. Obviously, you add a lot of nuance to them and, and how to approach them and how to see them, to, you know, given your, your quite unique perspective. One thing that, that stood out to me is, uh, again, again, thinking back of the, the first edition of your uh, Rethinking the Big Pattern seminar, I remember locomotion being pattern number one. And uh, what I, if I could remember correctly, and, and here you have breathing as pattern number one. And I know that ever since I started following your work, uh, many years back, breathing was always fairly central to your, to your frame, to your framework. Uh, You know, talk about PRI, you mentioned Bill Hartman, Aaron Davis more recently, Uh, all those things have, have come together. So can you maybe talk about the evolution of your perspective of breathing and what place it holds now in your overall perspective on human movement and performance? Yeah, I wouldn't say that it's any more important than any others. Like the number, the sequence of those numbers is not a ranking of importance Mm. in any way, shape or form. 
Um, so to me, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I think that the biggest thing is like, I, I would go to pillar number five for this answer in terms of movement strategies. And this is something that comes from Bill and there's expansion and compression. And, you know, to me, you know, Bill said some really amazing things to me over the years. And one of the things he said that really, really stands out in my mind, I don't even remember what my question was, but his answer was, well, if you're from the universe, then you have to abide by its laws. And, you know, I've, that statement has come back to me so many different ways, but I think that, you know, we get so stuck on this concept of evolution only applying to biology. Mm -hmm. And I think evolution applies to that, to beyond biology. And, and I think that it applies to, to movement as well. And things moved before biological life emerged in the universe. Inanimate objects move. And there are Newtonian physics laws that pertain to the, their movement. Um, and, and so some of the things that we know about movement, I would say that the first law of movement is that things expand or compress. And that's basically it. And everything else is a manifestation of that on some level. And it's the origin and it's the end. It's the big bang and it'll be whatever they call it, the big, the big compress going in back into the singularity. So molecules, ions do the same thing. You know, they can, they'll, they'll flow down a concentration gradient from, from high to low. Uh, and, and I would just call that expanding. And they can be pumped against that concentration gradient. And that would, I would just call that compressing. And, you know, I think about, you know, older animals or older life forms, like once we get to biology, and you think about like an amoeba or something like that, and that all it does is kind of expand and compress. When I think about, um, you know, jellyfish would do the same damn thing. Like that's how it moves through, through life. And, and really, I look at like, uh, you know, you get to a human. And it's almost like we have many animals inside of us that make us up into a super animal in some ways. Like I look at a diaphragm and I'm like, that's clearly just a jellyfish. Like that's a <laughs> jellyfish inside of our bodies that we adopted at some point in time. Like, you know, a heart is kind of like a sponge. It's, there's, there's all these, these things like the, our organ systems to me are just older animals that took up residence inside of a super animal. And I don't know if there's validity to that, but I look at it and I see that sort of a thing. But these things also move and it's very easy to see lungs expand and compress. It's very easy to see a heart expand during diastole and compress during systole. That's movement, you know, it's like, it's not just moving arms and legs and thorax and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, breathing is a very easy to observe expansion and compression phenomenon that is part of a movement piece that involves movement of uh, animate biological tissue as well as inanimate, inorganic uh, matter in terms of air. And it's always going to be this, this interplay between the movement of inanimate, inorganic, and animate organic that will be the physical displays that we have as a species. So, you know, uh, I think that the, one of the coolest things that I've taken from Bill from a usefulness standpoint is that the human skeleton and the design of it is full of constraints. You know, like the bones basically create their own constraints for the directions that certain joints can move based on their shape, mm. but that there are stereotypical movements of joints that would be within the family of expansion or compression. Um, you know, so if I say that diastole is the expansion phase of the uh, you know cardiac cycle, and then systole is the compression phase of the cardiac cycle. I could say a similar thing in terms of the ankle, and I could say that the ankle would feature a, an expansion, plantar flexion, supination sort of a phenomenon, and a compression, dorsiflexion, pronation kind of a coupling. And the same thing could be true of a hip or a pelvis with you know flexion, abduction, external rotation being the expansion parts and extension, adduction, and internal rotation being the compression parts. So I don't see really any difference between an ankle going into plantar flexion and an inhale. It's the same thing. It's all an inhale. It's all an expansion piece. You know, I don't see any difference between a femur internally rotating and an exhale. 
I don't see any difference between a hand supinating and an inhale. It's the same, it's just a different manifestation, manifestation of the same strategy. So I think that breathing is, is it even a program? Like I look at my own model and I'm, I can tear it apart, you know, from now till Sunday, all day, every day and twice on Tuesday. And I would definitely start with saying like, I don't know if any of these things are even actually motor programs that are different from one another. They're just different variations of shape change that are expressions of movement strategies and that sometimes they occur against different loading zones and in different velocity spectrums along different duration continuums. But overall, it's just whether or not you're able to create these movement strategies in various parts of your body um, to be able to express expansion or compression to solve a task. You know, literally everything about you from a biological perspective is an evolutionary puzzle solving procedure that gave you the ability to perform tasks. And breathing is just simply another one of those uh, things that was, was kind of evolution figured out how to do that so that it could allow you to manipulate your environment so that you can maintain life, uh, you know, consume some level of calories that could allow you to continue to exist here and to potentially be a really good billboard to reproduce. So I don't see it as necessarily, I, I think it's like a big Venn diagram with a ton of intersecting circles, but I do not see breathing as being distinct and special and the end all be all or the starting place or anything else differently. Like I, I feel like I could start in any of those patterns, literally, you know, breathing is throwing and throwing is breathing. Like it's, it's the same thing. So yeah, like you said, it's, it's more of a, an integrated view of, of how things work with, kind of almost first principles that that underlie everything rather than this is the start or this is the end like like you just said yeah you know it's it's like i i i acknowledge the fact that i can be a contradictory being on a planet that is incredibly contradictory but it's it's not that it's it's that i i think that complexity allows for different seemingly polar statements to simultaneously be true. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> like I, I've said this before where, and I'll, I'll relay this back very specifically to, to like the point that I'm going to be making here is that for, from a usefulness standpoint, I try to be as organized as possible and I am a divide and conquer type of thinker. So my first objective is to try to create as many categories that I feel like are distinct in some way, shape or form from each mm -hmm. other as I possibly can. I believe in reductionism from a usefulness standpoint. It's the most useful model that's ever existed. And I will always be reductionist to accomplish things. Um, now, there are some flaws with reductionism, but they're not, they're, they're not worth abandoning it from a usefulness standpoint. Mm -hmm. They're worth pointing out from a discussion standpoint. But simultaneously, so it's like, look, like this is one of these prime examples of I will always be reductionist to accomplish things, despite the fact that I know that it's flawed. And I like talking about its flaws, but even though the flaws are fun to point out, I will always go back to it to accomplish tasks. So it's the same thing as so the model itself is is the most reductionist thing i possibly could create mm -hmm. and i believe that it being that allows it to be the most useful thing that i could provide for people but my prime example of where these seemingly diametrically opposite concepts can be present at the same time and still be true is when i think about just like us as beings um you know it's like a human a singular human being on this planet is both incredibly important and unbelievably unimportant at the same time you know because a singular human being could potentially 
think of something that could change the course of the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, for sure change the course of the planet. And for sure, each singular human being can be very important to the lives of other people. You know, the, the emotional state of a singular person can be so powerful and profound. You know, when you think about a, an adult human in their prime that's competent and functional, they might have children that depend on them. They might have elderly people in their family that depend on them. They may have employees with their families and their dependents that depend ultimately on them. It's an incredible network of, of dependence and, and your personal state can influence a lot of individuals. But at the same time, despite the fact that you can have feelings that feel crushing and that all of these people can have feelings that can feel crushing that depend on you at the same time you are so such a speck of dust compared to the overall size of this planet that it's like impossible to even conceive of how small you are relative to the planet but then the planet is such a small speck of dust compared to the sun that it's almost impossible to imagine how small it is relative to the sun. And then the sun is such a small speck relative to the overall galaxy that it's part of, that it's almost impossible to conceive of how small it is relative to that greater size. And then the galaxy is such a <laughs> small little speck relative to this greater universe that we're a part of. And apparently the universe is a speck of dust in a multiverse. So it's like, you're a speck of dust inside of 25 other specks of dust. Like you're so microscopic and unimportant to the greater scale of things that it's way beyond a human brain's possibility of actually conceiving of how insignificant you actually are. But both of those things are true exactly at the same time. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I like, I always like when you, you pull it back to the the most macro view possible of of all things. It, it always uh, gives a good perspective on things. Another another aspect that I where I kind of spotted a difference between the version one and and this final version of your book is the the way you split uh, core training. Um, in uh, rethinking the big patterns one, if I remember correctly, you had sagittal on one side and then the frontal and transverse in another bucket. And what it's shifted to now is uh, a pelvis focus and a thorax focus. So can you maybe explain your, uh, the evolution of your thought process around that specific, uh, around those two specific patterns as you, as you call them in the book? Yeah, I don't even remember. I, I to me, I, I feel like it was always pelvis and core thorax, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it's, it's just a focus, you know, it, like I always like teaching the seminar and saying to people, Hey, what's exercise number one for core pelvis bilateral stance sagittal plane. And after people have been through the principles of progression and they understand the thought process that, go, that goes into it, it's very easy for them to identify, um, you know, exercise number one for core pelvis, bilateral stance sagittal plane. They're like, oh, okay, well, no, you're gonna be laying on the ground because that's gonna minimize gravity. Uh, we're gonna have maximum reference. So we're gonna have your heels against something we're going to be in short levers. We're going to have constraints. So the ground will be level to keep your body in line for, for sagittal motor competency. I guess when I think about it, it's probably a 90, 90 hip lift. That mm -hmm. seems to be what exercise number one would be for that pattern. Okay. And the target tissues, according to sensory competencies for the sagittal plane, uh, for the pelvis are glutes and hamstrings, but we're in a position of hip flexion. So it's going to be hamstrings. Easy. It just leads you right there. Boom. And then it's kind of like, all right, well, what's exercise number one for core thorax, bilateral stance, sagittal plane? And people are like, okay, well, it's got to be, you know, minimize gravity. So we're going to put them on the ground again. It's got to be short levers. So it's probably going to be 90-90 position. Uh, we want to maximize references for sagittal plane and the sagittal plane references the heels. Hmm. It's the same exercise. 90-90 <laughs> hip lift. What's the difference? The difference is that we're going to put more of an emphasis on reaching with the arms 
in the core thorax version. And in the core pelvis version, we're going to put more of an emphasis on what we're doing with the pelvis and with the femurs during that exercise. But it's the same exercise. It's just the emphasis changes. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of go through the whole thing in, in some of the, and there's, there's instances where it's the same, and then there's instances where it branches off and breaks away. But it's, it, it, to me, it was like, well, you know, you get to the point where like almost every exercise is a, an integrated core exercise where you have targets that are in the thorax and the pelvis. But again, as a divide and conquer thinker, mm. you know, I want to give people that are starting off with this the greatest probability of being successful that they possibly can. So don't try to do all things at once in the beginning. Like you're not ready for it. Be a line cook before you try to be a master chef. And a line cook just cooks the same thing over and over, very basic. Um, you know, once you get to the point where you're a master chef, hey man, yeah, have fun, like play around, like integrate and you know, but at the same time, like I still follow the same principles of progression, you know, even like, uh, you know, I work with, with trainers from New York. Sometimes they'll book sessions with me because they're like, Hey, I, I'm, you know, I'm going through your stuff. Uh, I think it would just be really helpful for me to actually like be a client of yours for a month or two so I can get coached by you and sort of feel this out and figure it out. And it's been really successful. I really enjoy those sessions because all of a sudden they start to really see like, oh my God. Like, so, you know, I was working with somebody the other day and he was like, all right, you know, I really want to get this frontal plane pelvis stuff down. All right. Like, how do we, how do we do this? And I was like, well, what are the principles of progression? We, we go through these things and it's like, well, start sagittal. And I'm like, yeah, it's a frontal plane drill, but we're still starting sagittal. It's still, we always go back to the same principles. So if you don't have a good sagittal base here, there's no way we're going to be able to add on this progression to getting to frontal plane. And I love doing this in seminars too. I'm like, because people have the same questions over and over again. They're like, well, how long do I have to stay with this sagittal, you know, start before I progress to this next thing? And I'm like, I don't know. It could be, could be three weeks for somebody. Could be I'm like, I'm like, look, I'm providing you with these sensory motor competencies. When someone is clearly competent, progress. That's your answer. Like if they're competent and you feel like they can progress, progress. And if they're incompetent, regress. There's no timeline that's specific. So I'm like, here, I'll show you. I'll, 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 this is going to be an eight second uh, principles of progression demonstration. I'm going to take eight seconds, like bull riding, and I'm going to progress this person through the entire series. So, you know, if you get somebody that's, that's a, you know, if I get a professional athlete, they might go through, through 15 layers of progression in, in four minutes with me with an exercise. But I always start in the same place, set the foundation. And then once the foundation is set, I just follow the same damn things. I go from, you know, stance wise from bilateral stance to front back to lateral. I can do that in the same exercise. I go from sagittal plane to frontal plane to transverse plane. I can do that in the same exercise. I go from short levers to long levers. I can do that in the same, every single one of these things I can basically build out in the same, same way. And then people see it and they're like, oh shit, I didn't know that it applied acutely as well as chronically. I'm like, yeah, that's, it's a principle. It applies across the board in all circumstances. It's not just, it's not as cookie cutter as you think it is. It's fluid and flexible and something that you can return to. It is something that will provide the invariant representation starting point that you build off of. If a pitcher in the major leagues is getting ready for a game, I guarantee they start off in the bullpen and they start the same way. They do a few easy tosses. They don't go out and have their first practice throw be a, a slider. You know, it's just not something that they do. They'll build up with, with just some easy toss. They'll go into long toss. And then once they are throwing to a catcher off the mound, it's going to be fastballs first. I'm like, that's a sagittal pitch, okay? And then what are they going to do? They're probably going to go with more of like they're going to throw their off-speed pitch. Here's a changeup, okay? They're playing with velocity. Now here's going to be a curveball, a slider. You know, these are the other planes, the, the other layers being added to it. But they would start the same way. It's other sports, like it's the same kind of thing, mm. you know? So to me, it's like jujitsu warm up. 
what do you do? Like you kind of start off with these drills where you're like, you know, uh, swimming for underhooks. And then you get into these other, like it's, it's across the board preparation for activities. And the more that you sort of see the way that these principles play out, the more you're like, oh, okay, if I am just giving myself a better opportunity to prepare the person to execute the ultimate desired outcome as, with the highest probability of doing it right. Uh, Pat, I wanted to spend a couple minutes on the next question here and then move to rapid fire questions to finish off. Uh, one thing that struck me here on, on this, uh, this book compared to what you presented previously, like I said already before, is the, the, you, you went in much more detail on the sprinting and the change of direction work. Uh, you had locomotion as one of the patterns. You obviously uh, talked about throwing and jumping already in, in the previous iterations, but what brought you to, towards the, the, the including more information on the sprinting and the, the change of direction, which is, which now, you know, pulls us out of the gym and really makes this uh, a very, a more holistic athletic approach, let's say to, to things as opposed to, like I said before, just squat, hinge, push, pull. Well, it was always there, Sean. It was always there. We didn't, didn't have we, enough time. Right. We didn't do any, we didn't do any sprinting drills during the, the seminar. Not enough time the weekend seminar. And I, you know, it's like, it was kind of cold and raining in Vancouver, you know? So it's, it's always been there. It's mm -hmm. always been in there, but there's never enough time. You know, it, it, it took me two years to make this book project come to life. Like mm -hmm. you've got two days uh, with a seminar. And at that point in time in Vancouver, probably 10% of the people that were there knew what the hell I was talking about to start off with. So I'm following the same principles as when I coach exercise. I got to start off slow and mm -hmm. with the basics. Like you got to like if people don't understand the it, it at a very slow level with, with like core exercises, how the hell are they going to see it at full speed with with uh, sprinting and jumping and throwing med balls and things like that? Mm -hmm. But I mean, trust me, this stuff has been. It, it's not like this stuff just popped out of out of somewhere like a couple days ago. It's like you know. I was when I was at peak performance six years ago now, the 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 model was kind of already in the works. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like like I was working with the trainers and interns there of you know designing it across the board with every single pattern that, that's currently still there. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, like I, I the 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 locomotion information is stuff that I was teaching eight or nine years ago. Uh, when I was at Springfield College, um, you know, I, I literally just pulled it from a lecture that at that point in time that I made, I think, nine years ago, that was called How to Build the Fastest Humans on Earth. You know, this, none of, none, not, that stuff was old, man. That was new at all. That's been there the whole time. So it's just that when you're teaching a seminar, like, imagine how long it would take to teach a seminar that taught all of that information. That itself would be a two-day seminar. And then there'd be another two day seminar for the med ball throws and another one. So, you know, the, like, I don't know if you've even gotten to the chapter after that, which is the triple extension chapter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that chapter was, was half of that chapter is from my doctoral dissertation lit review, you know, like the, maybe three quarters of that chapter is. And I wrote that dissertation, uh, 11, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not new stuff. It's, it's over a decade old, that chapter. Um, it's just that all of a sudden it gets to play with the newer stuff. Yeah. It's, it's great to see the, like you said, nothing is new and, and you've been working on that for, for a long time, but seeing it all come together and, and really mesh well together with those underlying principles and, and all the patterns that you've talked about for, for a long time is, is really great to see, man. I, I want to finish with a few uh, rapid fire questions here. And then, uh, like I said before the call, I'd like you to just read the last three paragraphs to, to end the, the interview, but rapid fire questions. How long did it take you to write this book? Two years. Favorite part but, to write. But oh. I would have to add to that. Yeah. Like I just said, there's sections of this book that are 11 years old, 12 mm -hmm. years old. Still counts. It took my whole, it took my whole life to write. This book. <laughs> Here's the answer that I was after. Uh, what was your favorite part to write? The section on, in the principles of progression chapter 
that integrates the propulsion arc with the 10 principles of progression mm. and the, the, uh, the ways in which, like from a, a mechanistic perspective, how it came together and how that information can be implemented to uh, exercise progressions. What was the hardest part to write? Some of the breakdowns on, on what you're seeing when you're watching athletes in their motions. There was a part um, where I broke down a, a speed skating stride. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember what chapter that's in. But that was incredibly difficult because of trying to um, – and that was I, – I, I had to run that by Bill – to see if my initial impression was was correct and and it was off because I didn't really appreciate the way in which a low friction ice environment along with the constraints of a skate creates an exaggerated late propulsion um, like movement with the way that people skate and that when when I went through that discussion with him, I really started to understand compensations that take place when there are joint structural changes that can occur either from equipment or from injury. And it allowed me to just see that when you see any kind of exaggerated type of movement, it will always be compensatory. And that could be when you see somebody moving really ugly, that's exaggerated. And that's something is compensatory. Um, and ice skates basically create that because you don't have access to a big toe to push off the ground with. So you have to really create this super exaggerated abduction um, with your push off. Mm. So it was really, you know, and it's like, you know that late propulsion is expansion because when you see that compensation and that extreme abduction, which is part of expansion, it's just so visual and apparent all of a sudden. What was the, in, from all the elements you covered in the book, in your opinion, currently, what is the most underrated element in strength and conditioning? Well, you know, that kind of goes back to a conversation I, I had with Ethan Gross when we were walking across Union Square, you know, heading back to the gym. And I was talking to him about like what he was currently reading and going through. And he was like, you know, I finished going through all the old Russian program design stuff and some of like the, you know, East German program design stuff. And, you know, I really think that after going through all this stuff, periodization discussion literally just comes down to being a, a good planner. And I'm really good at planning things. So I think, I think that it's it's people get so sucked into you know jargon and other things and and I think that most of your success will come down to how well you plan something out and planning to me is just taking your time and deliberately imagining how things are probably going to go and then imagining how things could go wrong and problem solving for that before it happens and in order to do that, I think that you need an entire spectrum in front of you of all things possible. And once you have that, now it's easier. It's like, it, you know, seeing, it's like the movie The Matrix with all the things falling mm -hmm. all the time. And if you're able to know the, what that means and you can pull things out of it, it makes it so much easier because you've already thought of it before it happened. And then once you've already thought of something and practiced it before it happened, it's so easy in the real time. It's almost like when you're watching Spider-Man and in the first one where he's in high school or something and he gets into the fight in the cafeteria and it's so slow for him. Like he's seeing this guy punch and it's like in slow motion. He like can walk around it, like look at his fist. If you've already practiced it and thought it through and understand it, everything happens so slow. And it literally looks like you're a superhero in the way that you can coach it and react to it and understand how to manipulate it. And other coaches are like, how the hell did you understand that? How'd you figure that out? And it's like, trust me, I've already seen this in my head a thousand times before this happened right now. Like, so that to me is the most underrated thing is, is you know, people, people don't appreciate how important planning is. And planning is just deliberate practice and sitting and imagining and working through the possibilities 
and figuring out how it works. And if you've done that, then you're prepared. Pat, thank you so much for coming back on today. Where can people find the book? It's at Renaissance Periodization. Um, if people are you know, going through me, I just put everything in my Instagram at this point, which is at Dr. Pat Davidson. Uh, and it's DR period Pat Davidson. Uh, I've got a link tree through my uh, Instagram bio link. And it's the first tab on that link tree. So it's very easy to get to. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very easy to afford price. You know, I wanted to make this thing very accessible to, to everybody. So uh, the guys at RP, I think, did a great job with making it easy to purchase and easy to access. And it's an ebook, So, you, you know, you click it, you buy it, it's yours immediately. There's no time to waste. And the people that want a hard copy, you know, there are some people that are just like insistent. Hey, man, Staples is a great spot. You <laughs> go there, they will print that thing out for you real yeah, cheap. Make, They'll make your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll make it into a binder for you. So, you know, even the book itself is part of its own concepts of Jacksonian dissolution. It's got <laughs> options. And if you want the older throwback version, it is available for you and you can revolt, you can resort back to it. That was a great way to finish off, Pat. Thank you so much again for everybody listening. Uh, the link is in the show notes to go and uh, find Pat's book. Go buy it, go read it, and then ask Pat all your questions uh, if you have any. Uh, thanks again, man. It was a pleasure. And do you want me to read through that last little section? If you have two minutes, yes. I do, sure. Let's do um, it. So let me pull this up real quick. And this is the, the last three paragraphs of the book. I do not believe in ultimate answers so much as in better questions. I believe in incomplete operating systems that serve as launch pads for eager workers. I believe in loving one's work passionately and consumingly, but welcoming criticism just as passionately and sincerely. Here, I offer you my sweat, my thoughts, my soul on paper. And as much as I want you to find it truthful and helpful to you and those you coach, if you stumble on ideas lacking accuracy or usefulness, I hope you initiate a dialogue to raise these concerns. I love this field, including the study of human expressions. As with any great love, you must offer it in totality and hold on for a ride of unbelievable highs and insufferable lows. Here's to giving ourselves freely, owning what we put out into the world, accepting what comes back from our offerings, always being willing to adapt and change, and never ceasing to strive for excellence along the way. Pat, thank you so much. Thank you, Sean.